Okay. Here's the deal with this, with my analysis of this. Right. I'm going to leave the um, Chinese room here. And I'm going to erase the rest of this argument. I'm just going to leave that first premise, because that's, that's the important premise. It says, computers can only do computations which are manipulations of abstract symbols. Computers can just manipulate abstract computer, uh, abstract symbols, therefore they can't do semantics, they can't do meaning, which is necessary to have a mind. Um, first objection to this is computers don't actually manipulate abstract symbols. Computers don't do that. Not fundamentally. They process binary coded data according to binary coded programs. Given an individual unit of information in a computer, how many values can it have? Given an individual unit of information in a computer, how many values can it have? Uh, in binary, it would be eight. Really? Well, an individual unit of information. Zero, one digit. We put one digit in there, how many values can we put in there? Uh, we have for one character in a computer. Binary code is zeros and ones. Right. Binary code you've got either a zero or a one. Yeah. In a logic gate, its output is either high or low. Right? No computer has an output that varies. No computer part of a computer has an output. We don't use analog computers anymore. That hasn't been done for, uh, oh, 60 years. We use binary computers. Every computer in operation today, inputs are either high, outputs are high, low, high, 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 low, 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 right? Bits of information. It's, in that computer, there's not arbitrary symbols being manipulated. There are vast numbers of individual processors, individual logic gates going, yes, no, yes, 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 no, 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 yes, no, no, on, off, on, off, on, off, on, 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 off, on, on, off, off, on, off, on, on, off, right? That thing where they show all the ones and zeros, that's what's going on in there. That's fundamentally what's going on there. Abstract symbol manipulation is one thing you can do with a computer if you write the correct program. You write a program to do abstract symbol manipulation, you can do that. But you can write programs to do other things <coughs> as well. Second point, Alan Turing 
proved that a certain kind of computer a Turing machine you had a Turing machine, right? Turing machine can perform any program doing any function you can think of. Now, this is one of those nifty little proofs that talks about the ultimate capabilities of things. What Turing proved was a certain kind of computer, a Turing machine. A Turing machine is a, is a computing device or an information manipulating a processing device that can perform any program, can do any function, any kind of translation of information from one form into another. Now, modern computers, um, like my laptop there, are Turing machines. Now, when I say, when I say that it can perform any function, I don't mean it can perform any function within five minutes. I don't mean it can perform any function within a week. Um, I've written programs that took three days to, to write out, and I had access to supercomputer time. And I, mean, and I, was, I was doing some massive data arrays, things you could not do on a laptop. Um, and, you know, it, it, they, would, they would take hours and hours and hours to run. Maybe not a week, but I think I've had pr programs that ran 12 hours. I'm like, is this actually working? And there are programs I could run on this that would take a week to run. Except I don't want to. I want to use my computer for other stuff. Right. Um, so, My brain does stuff, right? Um, my brain, my mind, has input and output. Inputs are all the information I've ever heard, all the things I've ever seen, all the, all, the, all the signals that have ever come into my mind. And my output is everything I say and do, right? Input, output. That's a function. Right? And so you can look at it this way. One of the things I do, one of the things that happens in my mind, is my entire philosophical education, starting with my first philosophy class, or actually the first book I read on philosophy, which is a really stupid book. Really, really stupid book. A waste of time. But then, you know, later I got into actual philosophy that was worth reading. Um, so all I've ever read about philosophy, all the discussions I've ever had with any professor, or student, or, or anybody about philosophy, all of that stuff that's come in is input. And my outputs are, well, all everything I do, including lectures like this. So this lecture that I've given this evening, that I'm giving this evening, is an output. It's a pattern of behavior in this, out of this machine that I am. Very, 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 very complicated machine but it's a program. It's a program that has translated all my inputs, my philosophical edu 
uh, education into these lectures. Now, for a computer to do this, that computer there could perhaps do a little tiny little bit of the processing involved in this before it wears out. It would tie up the computer forever to do maybe a little tiny bit of this. But if we had really, really big computers that could take in all the input and do all the processing, that were as complicated as a human brain, that could manipulate information in the way that we know human brains do, then a computer could do that. A computer can take any set of input and produce any set of output by processing it because Alan Turing has proved this. He gave a mathematical, well, I don't know if it's a mathematical, logical proof that whatever program someone comes up with, a computer can be made to do it. And I've got a program built into me, a self-modifying, very complicated, kind of cranky, uh, imperfect program that, that makes mistakes, right? But that could be programmed into a computer if we had a computer powerful enough, with enough memory, enough storage to take the whole program without blowing up. So, abstract symbol manipulation is one thing computers can do. But computers can do other things as well. So, this assumption is false. And this symbol translation table here is not the only way computers can be programmed. Remember, before the break, earlier than I talked about the artificial neurons. We can make a machine that does, in theory, we can one day make a machine that does everything your brain does in exactly the same way and which modifies itself in exactly the same way that your brain is modifying itself now. It can learn and imagine and be bored or interested or happy or unhappy and, and so on. All of those things. Now, we can see John Searle posing the question to us the first thing is how could computers do semantics? How would you make a computer that did semantics? How would that work? And there's the the quick answer and the short answer. I'm going to you know. First answer number one, which is always the answer to questions like this, the same way brains do. The basic argument for computer consciousness is, dudes, brains make consciousness, brains make minds, they do it by processing information, computers can process information. There is no in principle reason, no logical reason why brains, why computers cannot do what brains do. Cell tells us that computers can only manipulate abstract symbols, they can only do syntax. He doesn't prove this. He doesn't prove that computers can't do syntax. Instead, he gives us a model of a system that only does syntax, that only manipulates symbols and doesn't do meaning. Well, that, that showing a way to fail doesn't prove that success is impossible. Okay, so if Searle wants to push this point and say, oh no, you've got to prove, I'm going to ask a question. If 
Snell says, well, how exactly will they do that? I I'm going to say, well, how do brains do it? How would computers do it? How do brains do it? And what is semantics anyway? Big question is what is semantics? What is meaning? How do brains do meaning? Well, I happen to know a little bit about this, a tiny little bit. Um, do you know how visual memory works, where you have a particularly vivid memory, you, you have a visual memory of something? Like, have you ever had this thing where you find yourself remembering somebody's face? Or remembering an a, a image you saw? Uh, something in a movie, or, a, or out in the sky, or a, or a picture? But you have a visual memory? You know, the way that's actually accomplished in the brain is that the same pattern of activation that happened when you first saw that activates again. This is how sort of general long-term memories are stored, is that, say I see a sunset and it activates a whole bunch of um, stuff in the striate cortex, a particular pattern of activation in the striate cortex, I have something that reminds me of that, and it activates the whole pattern. And this is how knowledge is stored, um, is that, right, is that the pattern of activation when you heard it or experience recurs in a, in a different way, in a slightly different way. There's, you know, um, it's not as vivid, and you've also, it's sort of, juxtaposed with the input you're having now, so you not, it's not, no, it's not real. Although there are people who have flashbacks that they think are real, they think things are really happening, or they have hallucinations that they think are happening. The, um, John Nash, in A Beautiful Mind, imagines his college roommate, and he's just as real to Nash as you guys are to me or I am to you. Hopefully I'm real to you. Um, so, it's patterns of activation. We know how the brain uh, does meaning. Uh, well, it has, does memory. We know how the brain represents certain things. Fish. Suppose I say fish. What do you remember? What happens? How do you know what a fish is? Well, the, the, the primary thing is, if you've ever only ever seen a fish once, or you held a fish, or saw a fish swimming, you know the memory that comes to one of the memories that comes to my mind is the koi pond at Cal Poly Pomona. Uh, I've been there a couple of times and looked down at the koi, and they come up and like, "Have you got food?" And I'm like, "No, dude." And they're like, "Bastard!" And they swim away. They don't actually say "bastard." They just think it. Um, the uh, but right, you you remember. The visual impression, and maybe you've held a fish, and the tactile impression of feeling it between, in, in your hand. Those all add up, and they're sort of generalized. They're sort of averaged out, and that makes your memory of, of what a fish is. And that your brain is actually always adjusting these memories, incorporating them, putting together, putting them together, um, so that you know you have an image in your mind of what a fish is. Right? Well, those are data structures. That's building structures of data based on input. And we have sufficiently complicated computers, we can have computers to do that. All right. Now, <coughs> let's suppose that the Chinese room, instead of Instead of having a guy outside, has like, oh, I don't know, uh, TV cameras on one side. And these cameras put out not pictures, 
with combinations of various combinations of pat, uh, patterns of um, of colored lights. Right. There's a visual input coming in. Say like there's a tree. And this translates to, I don't know, uh, red and blue, okay, sort of pattern of red and blue rot lights up here. Something that goes out and can bump into things, right? And can feel them. Actually, I, I want to give it a hand. So it's like a hand comes out. Right? Uh, and there's, there's, there's wheels here. There's a motor in there, and it's got a steam engine built into it somewhere. And there's various kinds of inputs, and this thing is connected to another sort of set of outputs. Um, maybe these are things that make sound. It's a speaker. Right, so when it touches something, you hear a sound. Okay. Um, So, you've got this guy in here, and he's got all these things, I guess sound wouldn't be good, is it? Well, maybe he's just got things, that, well, this thing just shows Chinese characters, depending on what's out. And these are arbitrarily attached, not actually Chinese, we're not speaking Chinese anymore. They're arbitrarily attached to various things that can happen to this, to this rod. And um, you've got all these inputs and outputs. Now, and this guy is still just manipulating symbols. You get red lights in a diagonal line, and this character, it says, find this character, find this stuff. But instead of, um, instead of writing symbols, he's got this thing that's a bunch of buttons, different color buttons, but all in arrangement up here. And you know what he does is there's some pink buttons, and there's some blue buttons, and green buttons, and they're in rows and groups and things like this. Right. So when you see this, these colors and this symbol, you do you know he goes through and he looks it up and he says, okay, when you see this lot you do this. You see that, that, you do that. You see this, you do that. Right. Um, suppose this has been right, programmed. We're just going to talk about something that's programmed right now. That there's, This is set up so that um, this thing keeps moving. When it comes to a tree, you know, the arm hits it or the TV camera hits, sees it, and that's translated into symbols. This guy doesn't know what's going on. He doesn't even know the thing is moving. He's got no motion sense. And he takes the books and he looks through them and it says, do this, then do this, then do this. And this results in this thing steering around the tree. Right? You have inputs and you have outputs. Um, maybe, 
I don't know, instead of a tree, there's a, a raging fire. Raging fire with black smoke and stuff like that. Billowing smoke. Growing smoke. And the thing's going on and then this detects it. Maybe there's a, I don't know, maybe a, a heat detector. Right? On the outside that's to another control panel <coughs> that has a different kind of different si kinds of lights. Maybe they're all different kinds of lights. I kind of like that. Different, you know, these are So, and we have all these different lights, and when you get this combination, and this combination, and this combination, you do this, and when it's fire, it goes, backs off and goes a different way. You get this more and more complicated, and Maybe you can send in Chinese scrolls that are like instructions. I got this thing, you say, Searle's got this idea of the Chinese room. I've got this idea of the Chinese Roomba. The Chinese Roomba, it starts out as a machine that sort of learns how to map out the, you know, your apartment um, and uh, it has, has voice commands. You can say, Roomba, clean the bathroom floor and Roomba will go into the bathroom and clean the floor. Um, and let's say we put attachments on Roomba and say, Roomba, wash the windows and it's got attachments that allow it to wash the windows and stuff like that. And after a while, when you're doing this, and he's giving it more and more complicated instructions, it's like you start saying, well, the thing knows what I mean. And we've got our dog trained that if we say down the stairs, it runs down this little set of steps that I've built for it. At the, there's a, it's got an injured leg, and we had surgery, uh, it surgery last year, so... We made this, I made a set of stairs so it can come up there. And now it goes up and down the stairs. And I trained it to so, right, up the stairs, down the stairs, and it'll do that. Because it's a very accommodating dog. Okay. So the dog knows what up the stairs mean. It knows what sit means, it knows what leave it means. Because it really loves these treats we have for it in the evening. We have these duck jerky treats. Their friend got them for his friends got them for their cat because the cats loved them when they first tried them and then the cats are like oh no I've had that don't want it big big bag of duck jerky and did the dog sit stay leave it put the treat over there it's like stay 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 okay okay and the dog goes and picks it up so the dog knows what leave it means, and a dog knows what stay means. And so, think about like a mechanical dog that can be trained, right? You, you um, it has various inputs, and those inputs result in it changing its behavior. Is that implausible, right? If we had take a computer that instead of translating symbols into other symbols, translates sensory inputs into actions and we start keep making this more and more complicated and we start making the machine so that it can learn right we can teach things to dogs right? or we can teach it words for instance we say fire tree I mean we already have computers that can learn words, to learn, associate words and pictures. That's, that's kind of actually an easy task to do. If you, if you know anything about, if you're a competent programmer, you can program a computer to do visual object recognition and to associate visual inputs with, um, with words. 
Uh, and in fact, um, cognitive science does these things called neural nets, where, uh, where computers can train themselves to recognize certain things. Uh, this gets very complicated. One of the things that computers can do that humans can't is computers can recognize fingerprints. You, if you put your fingerprints, on a, um, if you input your fingerprints into a computer, they can check those computers against a database and tell it, tell you whose compu computer computer uh, whose fingerprint that is. Um, just a couple a year or so ago, they cracked facial recognition. Facial recognition, at one point, was reckoned to be a task that computers would never learn how to do, and it was very intractable. But I think they cracked it uh, within the last year. Correct me if I'm wrong. Um, which is rather stunning to me because facial recognition is actually a very, very, very complex task. So, right, you, we, could train, we could train the Chinese Roomba, or we could program the Chinese Roomba so it would learn people's names, right? Have a facial recognition chart. It sees a face that's not in its data bank and says, Hi, who are you? And you say, I'm Martin. And it says, Hi, Martin. And it remembers and it goes on to that. Now you think about this, we can train compute, we can make computers to do all these limited things. We can do that right now. We can't do it in any great complexity, but we can do it right now. And we can have a machine that could, um, right, you could take, for instance, you could go to Starbucks, get a cup of coffee, hand a cup of coffee to the Chinese Roomba, and you say, uh, this is for Dr. Young. He says, who's Dr. Young? And you say, well, you know, Martin, the guy with the hat. Because He goes, oh, okay. And then it goes to the corner and crosses the street and stuff like that. And we, have, we have machines, computer-controlled machines, that can drive cars in heavy traffic. And they're actually safer than human drivers. So it comes in, it goes in the elevator, presses the button. Hopefully it's got a... Oh, it's got to have another arm for that. Otherwise, you know, there's this button pressing device. We can keep putting devices on this thing and making it more and more capable. And a certain point with the computers we've got now, we'll hit the practical limit of what this thing can learn and what it can do. Um, but we could teach it, you know, pretty complicated things like uh, what to do in an emergency. Right? There's this, um, one of the problems with our emergency drills is that um, it's taking roll outside. So I always forget to take roll when we ever, ever have a drill. I'm like, oh, I'm sorry. Um, but so the, the alarm rings, uh, we all rush out, and I'm supposed to take roll. Well, the problem is, we don't know who's absent. My, my roll sheet is on the computer. I, I, well, actually, I could do it because I can just look at the uh, thing. But people have left. And I don't know who all has left, so I don't know who all is here. Well, you know, we have the Chinese Roomba in here. It says, and someone tells it, there's a fire on the first floor. It says, OK, an emergency drill. I'm going to go into all the classrooms and warn people. And it trundles in here and says, OK, everyone, everyone, everyone. And it stands up and says, Okay, now I know who all is here. I need everybody to go to the stairs and go downstairs and go out of the building because there's a fire. And then we go out to the building, we all go out of the building, and Roomba does this in a number of uh, classrooms, and it comes back out and... Okay, everyone's here. Because, you know, computers can do that kind of stuff much more efficiently than humans. It could take role. And the key thing here is it, it could know what to do if there's a fire. And if it has a sufficiently elaborate data structure, it could pull together disparate pieces of information. Like if it didn't, hadn't been told about fire drills or anything like that, if it, but it knew that fire was destructive and it had seen films of fires, operated fires, and someone said, the building's on fire, they'd say, holy crap, humans are flammable or can, can be damaged by fire. They can make inferences. 
We can do all of that stuff in computers, not, not to the, anywhere near the extent that we, can, that we can do it with brains, but when, when Searle says computers can't do semantics, that they can't know what something means, semantics is actually easy because you can program a computer to know what commands mean. You could program Roomba to know what clean the bathroom means. And it would do the things that are, that are necessary for that. Semantics is not a hard problem. Human brain, um, I, am I wrong? Is there something human brains do that, that computers can't do in regard to semantics? Is there a way that... Um, Something that human beings do about with meaning that computers couldn't do. The Chinese room that Searle designed had no way of, of doing semantics. Semantics was deliberately left out of the picture. But if you put wheels on the Chinese room and your symbol Symbols going in again, and I'm going to give you the simple Chinese room again. Except it's got wheels, right? With a little engine there, and a set of buttons here. And you've got the guy in there. With, uh, with all the books. And you know the slot, the slot inside where the scrolls come in. But this time the scrolls are movement commands. The guy doesn't know this. So you have the fellow outside and he writes in Chinese, roll forward three feet. And the guy, the guy inside goes to the books and it says, okay, write down these instructions, press button 15, 17, 19, 92, 81, 46. A sequence of buttons. You get a sequence of numbers. And then he goes and he presses the numbers in this sequence and the thing, because the information is encoded in these books, moves forward four foot. Roll back three feet, turn 90 degrees. There's actually a board game called Robo Rally where you program a robot and then sort of unleash it into, among other robots and they bump into each other and shoot each other and knock each other off and it's, it's a lot of fun. Right? So, you have this thing and this information is going in and the bot, the room is, move, is doing stuff. Right? Turn around once. And you think about it. If I'm just talking about, if we've got a dog or a person, a child, and I'm telling it move forward two, two steps, go back two steps, turn to the right, and I'm just saying this stuff, and it's doing it. It knows what those commands mean. How is knowing what something means different from that? And the answer is, it isn't. The Chinese room that Searle gives us is a model of a paralyzed person, a person who is completely paralyzed and all they can do is speak. When you have a person, when you have a Chinese room that can do stuff, go forward, go back, turn, turn around, do a wheelie, I don't know if you can do that, but this guy's not going to know what's happening. Right? He doesn't understand the commands, although he could after getting multiple commands, this is the, I mean, 
This command set is very simple now, right? We could actually make a Chinese room, room like this. Right? Because all we have is movement commands and distances and things, and it translates into this. He can start recognizing which patterns of, bu patterns of buttons he's going to press with what symbols. He would start learning it. I mean, that's not important because in the story, he's got to be someone who doesn't understand Chinese. So, when questions are going in in Chinese and answers are coming out, and we can say, okay, they're translating, they're answering the questions, but the room doesn't understand Chinese. That seems kind of plausible, right? That it doesn't understand Chinese. Or that the guy, certainly the guy doesn't understand Chinese. But when you give verbal commands, you, when you give commands to an object, and the object follows the commands, that seems to me to be very unreasonable to say it doesn't understand. Look, it doesn't know what you mean when you say move forward two feet and then it moves forward two feet. <coughs> How is that not understanding? That's what understanding is. Right? Any, any? So, Cell really doesn't understand the nature of semantics. I should have started with that one, right? Not the more complicated one. But I was having fun, you know. Okay, so Searle's argument doesn't work. Now here's the another argument, the qualia argument. And this is actually, a, uh, um, I mean, the cell argument was fairly tough. It's not a stupid argument. It's not like uh, Jerome Schaffer or the full supliability or correlation objection to mind-brain identity theory, which were just stupid. Searle's right. um, Chinese room is not a stupid argument at all. It's actually quite a brilliant argument. It's wrong, but it's brilliant. Qualia, uh, I think this argument's attributable to Thomas Nagel, who was a, who was a, who was a genius, um, is the argument that, look, we do qualia. Do you guys know what qualia is? We see qualities. Um, to give an example, imagine, you guys know what a scotoma is? Oh, God, I cannot draw. What card is that? Six of diamonds. Six of diamonds, yes. Randomly made up random seeming card. So, um, right, I told you the, the part of the brain that makes your visual field is called the striate cortex. It's in the occipital lobe of your brain. Now, damage to the occipital lobe um, reduces your ability to make a visual field. There's a particular kind of uh, there's a there are kind a particular kind of lesion. A lesion in your uh, striate cortex will make make what's called a scotoma. A scotoma is a blank spot in your sight, and it's not your eyes are fine. Your eyes are not damaged. It's the striate cortex is damaged and it's not making the visual field. And your, your eyes absorb, inf pass information to lots of different parts of your brain. Your eyes don't just go to the visual field, they go a lot of different places. I think they are, the optic nerve goes to the cerebellum too. Um, I'm not entirely sure of that, uh, maybe I'm wrong. Um, but if you have a lesion in the striate cortex, the part of your brain that makes your visual field, you'll have like a blank spot. I'm not sure exactly how it goes. It might be kind of a gray area, or it might be an area where everything crowds in. And you're... So if I had a scotoma, I would not be able to see my visual camera uh, my, uh, in the right place. I would not be able to see my uh, video cam, right? I wouldn't be able to see that gadget. 
uh, or I wouldn't see your face, I'm looking right at you. Right? So if you had a scotoma in the right place, you, my face could be invisible to me. You'd know I'm here, you can hear me talking, but you can't see my face if you're looking straight at me. So uh, they did this experiment with people with scotomas where they'd um, hold up a card in the, in the scotoma, in the, in the gap in the visual field. And they'd say, what card am I holding up? And the person would be with the scotoma would say, don't be stupid, I can't see it. I have a scotoma. Didn't, didn't you see the briefing? Right? And the guy would say, no, no, um, take a guess. Oh, come on, take a guess. No, I can't see the card. Well, take a guess. Okay, six of diamonds. They'd take a guess and the guess would be right. And the, the, part, the explanation for this is that the optic nerve goes to different parts of the brain, and the part of the brain that actually registers that as six of diamonds is not the visual field. The visual field um, gives you that visual reference. That visual field, by the way, is important for learning what things look like, but telling that that's the six of diamonds is actually not entirely done by the visual field, it's done by another part of the brain, which is kind of cool. But that's, that's not the important thing is, right? Knowing that I'm holding up the six of diamonds is very different from actually seeing the card. Right? Knowing that I'm holding up, I mean, if you close your eyes and I say, I'm holding up a red folder and you trust me, and you believe that I'm holding up a red folder. So you know I'm holding up a red folder. That's not the same as seeing this, is it? Right. Seeing this, seeing that color, registering that color, and seeing the, that it's not blue, right? Seeing that red is not blue, that's qualia. It's the quality of the thing, not the quantity or the shape or the size or anything. That's the quantity. And qualia is a name for all of the quality bits, right? How things feel, right? Uh, if things are smooth or rough or slimy or gooey. Uh, how things look, the timbre, the, the, the feel of sound, right? You know, the, you know, different people have different voices. Some voices are pleasant to listen to, some are unpleasant. Some are twangy, some are sort of a lot of burr in them, right? Some are nasal. People from Liverpool, are you from Liverpool? Right, the, do you remember the Beatles? They were all from Liverpool. Um, there's all of those qualities that we notice that can be different, that's called qualia. And the argument against computer consciousness here is, oh, well, you know, computers couldn't do qualia. Only human brains can do that. Now this is not Nagel's only argument about qualia, and he might actually not make this argument. He might be too smart to make this argument. But the, the argument is, well, only human brains can do qualia, therefore computers can't be conscious, because to be conscious, you have to have qualia. And that is actually a good point, because when I'm conscious, I'm conscious of qualities. In fact, we go back to Locke and Barclay, I'm conscious of these secondary qualities. Qualia are what come in as sense data, what we hear, see, feel, and so on. And then we interpret it to make models of the world. So that qualia is vitally important to mental operations because we need to have consciousness to, to sort of absorb information, I would think. Although, I guess, having a mind, <coughs> possibly have a mind without qualia, but it wouldn't be fun. So, so the first response to this is, why? Why is it only something human brains can do? The 
answer to that is because uh, um, can anyone, I mean, remembering what you read in the book, did the study questions, was there any suggestion of a reason why computers can't do qualia? Well, computers are different from brains, and brains can do qualia, so computers can't. A gasoline engine is different from a, uh, from a diesel engine, so, and a gasoline engine can drive a car, so a diesel engine cannot drive a car. There's nothing I, there's no, it's, a, it's, qualia are cool, it's wonderful, it's cool to think about, kind of mysterious. We don't know if other people have the same qualia that we do. But when you say computers can't do them, I want to know why. What is it about computers that says they can't? We can have machines that can detect qualia. We have machines that can, can um, detect. We have machines that can detect finer gradations in color than humans can. My girlfriend can, is much better at telling different shades of black from each other because she sees color differences that I don't. Uh, I knew someone who could see ultraviolet once. I never tested it, but I took a word for it. Right? There are people who can see ultra, a little bit into the ultraviolet. Don't know about infrared. So we don't know what life is or what experience is like for anyone else. Um, but none of that mystery translates into any reason that computers can't, couldn't do qualia. There's no reason to think that we could not hook a machine, a, a video camera, and a temperature sensor, and a, a, a sophisticated sound detector, like a microphone, to, hooked up to very, very uh, digital inputs and complicated computers and, and stuff that would not supply qualia to our hypothetical robot. Well, there's... Someone who defends the idea that uh, only human beings can do qualia might ask the question, well, how would they do it? How would computers do it? And the answer to that is, is very simple. Same way as human brains. Human brains do qualia, right? You guys are seeing differences in color, hearing differences in, in tone and timbre uh, between musical notes. I'm tone deaf by myself. I love music, but I can't tell one note from another. I can't, I, I have a hard time, when you play one note after another, I have a hard time telling whether the second note is higher or lower than the other note. I can tell that they're different, but I can't tell if they're higher or lower. I am just off, and I have, and I have terrible manual dexterity. I have attempted to play several different kinds of instruments, and the result is never pleasant. Uh, but you can tell differences, right, in qualia. How would computers do that? Well, the same way that human brains now do it. It's a simple, obvious answer, and there's no reason to see it, and there's nothing wrong with it. Um, Human brains do qualia now by processing information through neurons. We know what part of the brain does visual qualia. We know what parts of the brain do, actually I don't know, I don't know, but somebody knows what part of the, the does the oral, audible centers, the, the centers that detect differences in, there's some part of the brain that's known to do this, I'm pretty sure. I'd be really surprised they didn't. The auditory centers. I don't know where the auditory center is, but it detects differences in, uh, in timbre and tone and so on like that. Um, 
So we know how we know what part of brain makes the visual field: the striate cortex and the occipital lobe. Um, and we've done bits of things. They, they isolate once isolated a neuron in somebody's head that could tell the difference between a line going this way and a line going this way. If the line was this way, the neuron would not fire. The only way the neuron would fire is if it saw an a line angled like this. It might have been like that, but I think it was like this. And the neuron detected that and fired for it. So we know that a, 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 a visual field is built up by a whole bunch of individual, you know, bits of information put together. So we know that the brain does it. We have some tentative idea about how the brain does it, but we do know that the brain does it with neurons. So if we can make artificial neurons, we'll be able to make a visual field. All right, any questions? Questions, complaints, comments? Okay. Um, um, I want to talk about... Uh, eh, no, I don't. It's not going to be on the test. I want to talk about it. So, if there's no more questions, I'll let you guys go. Uh, is Jasmine? Uh, okay, so... Thank you all for your attention. Yes.